All right. So you guys, thanks for coming out. Um, this will be fun. Um, so the you guys had a chance to kind of walk through the office really quick. So we started this office project April of 1984. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> It feels like that. It feels like that. We started it like a year and a half ago, but it's good to like, this will be our first like official event that we're doing here, which is kind of cool to be able to have a little get together and have everybody here. Um, so the design of today was to kind of create a top agent panel. So I'm excited to be able to share a little bit with these amazing agents with you guys. So um, in, by way of introduction, my name is Aaron Russell um, with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. And our amazing panel, we'll just, I'll kind of go through and give a quick intro and then we'll kind of jump into things. So we have Amy Lasser Haynes, who's here. Amy has, I've known Amy for a long time. Um, we were many, many years ago at a similar brokerage and our, our paths have crossed again. So it's fun to work together. And Amy is uh, killing it in today's market. Um, and she's really moved up a lot into higher priced homes. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. So, and uh, Mike Gooch, who's in the house, who Mike's amazing. So uh, we're excited. And Mike is really from Southern California, um, a commercial, in, commercial real estate background. And, um, and we're happy to have him up here and he's killing it in the, in the marketplace here, doing really, really well. And a new dad. So, right? May, May was your first born in May, right? So cool. Yeah. And he's got it all figured out. Like if you want some advice on parenting, he can give it to you. Like he's got it. It's got it all worked out. So it's good. Um, and then we have Kylie Lance. Kylie, amazing agent. Um, some of you guys have known her. She's been on the board of directors uh, locally here in uh, Utah Central Board. Um, she runs a team as, as well as she's a, a owner of her brokerage and uh, she's done really, really well. She's really good at not telling you how good she is, but she's really good. <laughs> So, um, but that's kind of our, our panel. So I'm glad you guys are here. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. And um, we'll just kind of jump into some questions and we'll kind of share some different things and we'll have some time at the end where you guys can kind of share a little bit about, and you guys can ask some questions too. So, so I guess the first question I would have is 2023, whew, the market's a little bit different. So what are some of your insights and thoughts about today's market versus what you've seen in the past? Do you want to start us off, Amy? I've got a little, you do not have to wear this head. We should, what I should do is keep this mic and make you guys pass the headset around. Thank you. That'd be way better. Uh, the market's definitely different than it was a couple years ago. Um, I've thought about this a lot because even during COVID, you had to pivot your business. Um, like the norm of going in and making an offer with a buyer and having a chance of getting accepted totally changed during COVID. And then today you have a buyer, but they have problems qualifying where you have a seller and you have to have these uncomfortable, real conversations with them in today's market about what selling your house really looks like or when you're on the buyer's side what buying really looks like you know being not married to your interest rate i just think that there's a lot more crucial conversations and setting expectations with both sellers and buyers compared to covid times where i would put a listing on the market and have 20 offers in 24 hours just things are different and so setting expectations up front i think has been really huge for my clients this year and then when the house sits on the market for 33 days or 44 days or whatever it is they can say oh i had this conversation with amy this is normal or whatever the case is on that particular listing so i think the conversations have changed for me yeah i agree with everything that amy said and i could probably do a lot better with having that conversation with the the clients just so they know they know what to expect um I'd say for me, I I help a lot of clients buy rental properties, and that has definitely been uh, harder to make sense of in this market just because, as you guys know, interest rates have just been terrible. Uh, it's really tough to make these rental properties pencil. So a lot of my clients are looking very long-term with these rental properties will, where they will acquire them for tax write-off reasons and basically are just trying to break even. Um, but it's uh it's not as fun as last year and two years before that's for sure <laughs> uh i'd say i think one of the biggest um one of the biggest hurdles a lot of new agents have is they don't have a good team between their 
lender and their title company to have hard conversations with buyers that don't know what to expect. And I think as soon as you um, saddle up with a good lender that knows exactly how to explain their options as far as a buy down, um, if that's worth it to them to pay for the buy down or if they're going to refinance in the short term, what that looks like. Uh, I also feel like um, even having a, a mentor or a coach is pretty much imperative right now. So being at the right company, having the right leadership, and being able to have a resource and someone close to you. That's cool. So let's let's let's, let's come back down around. I mean, so Kyla, you talked a little bit about um, like having the right mentor or coaches. Like, so if you look at your real estate career, like who are some impactful people you've had over the years who have like really helped? And can you think of like different lessons that were taught or different things that were shared that you thought, man, that was. Or looking back at it, you're like that person, like really helped to pave a, like a pathway for me. Or it doesn't even have to be the person you're talking about, but just like are there certain critical things that you came up with that that were like helped you get to different places in your business. I think the I think the biggest takeaway for me is don't start from scratch. Rip off and duplicate what someone else has already done. You don't need to take ten years to build a successful business in this industry. Um, I think that there's a lot of great programs and a lot of people that have already learned the hard lessons that you can take from. And I think previous brokers that I've had have taught me a lot. Um, and I think being ethical and doing things the right way is probably the biggest one. So if you're not ethical, start now. That's your advice. Like this, <laughs> that's like your, yeah. like that's like your take. So if there's like people in the back, like, like, like people, I see writing it down, start being ethical. No, <laughs> good. It's a great takeaway for today's event. But wise advice, Sage. Yeah. Do you want me to carry on with? Yeah, that's with great. That? It'll be good. Yeah, I'd say I agree completely that having a mentor is absolutely pivotal. Just when you're at least starting out. I started out in Los Angeles, and um, was doing more office leasing and sales. And as you guys know, I just that industry also got destroyed in office leasing side of things. But for the three years I was there, I had a really good mentor who um, I was able to sharpen my teeth and learn the industry. It's not too different doing the leasing and sales side of office space as it is residential homes. Um, but just learning the process of just little small things is, is so imperative. So if you don't have a mentor, I definitely would recommend trying to find one in Los Angeles. I made no money. I. I made like $20,000, I think the first year. Second year, I think it was 35-ish, 40. <laughs> and the year after, it was like 55. Like, it was so bad. But I was fortunate enough to learn under the best office leasing broker in Los Angeles. And that experience has really catapulted me to have success here. So I guess my little takeaway is don't feel like it's a waste of time if you're learning under someone and not making a lot of money because it'll eventually pay its dividends down the road. Thank you. Um, when I started 23 years ago, they didn't have the training that you have now. And so I would definitely say, like, utilize all of this like free training that you guys have at your disposal, whether it's online or through your brokerage, um, especially when you're not busy. I feel like it will keep your momentum going um, if you feel like you're doing something involved in real estate instead of wondering why I'm not closing deals. You know, it will all come in time and you have to learn how to be a good realtor. They don't teach you that in school. They teach you how to not get sued so that you walk around on eggshells, which is good. And you need to learn how to walk people through homes, how to negotiate. There's just a lot. And so I would just say yes on getting a mentor. Um, I've never had one except for I did get a life coach four years ago and I stayed with him for about a year and a half. And it's like being in the business for so long, I still feel like I need to learn, but I felt like I actually needed more of like the life coaching, the this is how you can compartmentalize and not stress out about money and not stress out about exterior things going on in your life. So I just got myself right inside and I definitely feel that that has helped me grow with my business over the last few years. Oh, that's awesome. Um so looking at that, I mean, because I've always seen and, and, have, and I've seen in my own business that 
my business grows in direct proportion to my own personal growth. Like if I focus on ways of improving myself, then my business will follow suit. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, like over the years, as you look at your business, even in the last couple of years, are there certain key things that you've done personally that have really helped to open things up for your business? Like are there certain things that if you were to look at the version of you that sits here in front of everyone right now, like what's something that you're better at today than maybe a couple of years ago? Like, oh, that was probably one of my weaker parts of who I was. Is there anything that you could, you say, yeah, that was a huge growth thing that has led to my business growing. Is there anything in particular you can think of, like maybe personal things that you've done or different attributes that you've done? So Amy, you got. So this is my biggest tip for everyone. Like I walk around and shout this from the rooftop. If you can figure out what six months worth of bills looks like to you, and have that in a savings account or work towards having that in a savings account that you never touch, you will be the best realtor version of yourself. You will walk into listings without desperation. You will work with buyers and cut the cords when you need to and not work with people for too long that are never going to end up closing on a deal. Um, It just gives you such a different mindset if you don't walk in needing that deal, whether it's a buyer or a seller. And I learned that just a few years ago. Um, I heard it years and years ago, and I kind of had a little nest egg, but my number grows over the years of what makes me feel comfortable. But I love being able to walk into a listing and say, I don't need to sell your house. I'm here and I will work hard for you because I want to sell your house. And that is just such a different mindset. So like, that's my biggest advice. Um, I grew up super poor. We didn't even have plumbing in our house until I was like six or seven. We had an outhouse and it was by choice. I had hippie parents that just did not care about anything but living life and being happy. And so I have a scarcity mindset. And so continuing like to remind myself, have you done without in the last 10 years? And if the answer is no, I don't need to stress about it. I can let it go. And that six months worth of bills really helps too. Cool. That's good. Yeah, that's incredible advice. I, I, to to add to what Amy said, I like how Ryan Serhan said that you try to be as busy as possible so when deals don't go as planned, you can cut them loose, like Amy said, and not lose sleep over it. You're almost relieved in a way because that issue is behind you and you can move on to other things. So that would be a good, good focus. But I'd say what things I've done uh, recently that, that have paid off are pay more attention to my my friends and having genuine relationships with them. Now it's a touchy subject because you never want to be, you know, that weasel who is just friends with someone to hope that you gain their business. You never want to come off as that person. And I might be the might be an unpopular belief, but I hate talking about real estate to my friends. I never do it unless they bring it up because I never want them to think that I'm only hanging out with them because I'm trying to buy them, help them buy a home or sell their home. Um, but over the past year, I've really tried to focus on taking good care of my friends. For example, if a friend refers me business, I take them out to a very nice dinner or I send them Um, a gift to show my appreciation. The way I view it is that it's marketing where if I would have spent so and so amount of dollars in postcards or um, online advertising to get a client, how much money would I've spent to get this same referral? And that money I would have spent, I in some way impart it to my friend if it's through golf or going to a sporting event or something to to show them I appreciate them and grateful for them. So that would be my number one ticket. It's just cherish your friends genuinely and uh, and show the love when they do uh, show it to you. I 100% think this is a relationship business all day long. Uh, your dental hygienist, your beautician, your a person doing your pedicure, whatever. Um, I think having good interpersonal relationships with people gets you where you're going to be successful. I would say for me, um, what I think is really imperative in in this particular business is making sure you're mentally, physically, and emotionally in a good space. 
and it's really hard to get all of that at one time. Um, and I've also watched that mindset, uh, specifically in the last year, mindset is so heavy and it makes such a huge difference in your business that if you don't believe in yourself and you don't want to get out of bed, then you're not going to be successful. So you have to really push yourself even if you don't feel like you're in the right headspace. But I also agree, um, the association has free education classes all the time. So even if you don't have anything going on, putting yourself in a, a room of people that are like-minded, trying to do the same as you, is always super helpful. And I think physically getting out and getting a hike in or going for a walk or a bike ride, whatever it looks like, will always put you in a good headspace. Well, that's great um because I, I mean in the room and and people that are going to watch some of the videos and stuff i mean you're gonna have people that are that they'll feel stuck that they're gonna feel and then even in during this this last year you have people who feel at different moments like oh this is not this is not like it, what it was and this is just different and there are many times where people will just feel throughout maybe a, a good day or a week that just things are really hard and it's just not like it's just not working like they thought it was going to work so when you come across days like that, when you come across moments where the listing falls apart or the deal doesn't work out like you thought or clients that you thought for sure were going to work with you don't work with you or it feels like your pipeline isn't what you want it to be and it's kind of off track and you just you feel like things are out of line. Like what are like what are your go to things that you've done in the last year or so that have like helped you feel like you're on like making forward momentum? Because I mean, we, I think we all feel that, right? If you've been around for long enough, if you have you've had enough moments where you feel like you've struck out and you're like maybe a like a hitter slump and you're like oh like what the heck and you start to like go i mean if, i remember for me like there were times in the past i'd jump on ksl i'm like what kind of jobs can you get with a real estate license and you like look on ads and you like look on like oh that's like for like ten dollars an hour like oh how many hours would that be like is it worth it's guaranteed income and i like start to do the math I'm like can i be that person's assistant like i don't know probably i'm probably underqualified so but like you would like every once in a while like i'd look at those like where's the guaranteed income is there a place that i can go and search um so when you have those moments and you're kind of feeling like that or maybe i'm the only one that feels that way but like when you have those moments where you kind of feel like it's off track like what's your go-to do you have a recipe or it's like certain things you're like all right this is my this is what i do like if i'm, I'm gonna get back on track i start to do these things yeah i think it's it's good to talk about this because i feel like when we're depressed or in a slump, we think we're the only person that is ever in that situation. Everyone else around you is crushing it. Like, I feel like for myself, I had a very successful year last year and then winter came along and it was so slow. Like I had probably four months where I was just like, man, which, which things am I gonna have to start selling? <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I've always wanted to have this truck. You know, I want my my future kids to drive this this truck, but I guess I'm gonna have to sell this to make sure I have a nice buffer in case this is a 2008. And you know, so I was I was stressing. So I think it's important to realize that everyone has slumps. Even the greatest baseball players of all time have have slumps. And um, just to realize where you came from and look back and be humble and see how far you've come is important. And uh, I think also to remember that every industry has tough things about it. You know, I also was like, man, I guess I'm selling solar in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this this springtime, I'm gonna pack up and, and full send it with there. But if you're walking those guys' shoes, those guys have some of the toughest jobs in the world. It might seem like they're always living the dream on, on social media. And I think a lot of them maybe are, but it's a tough, yeah. tough job. I mean, those guys are knocking doors every day and dealing with rejection. So I don't know. I think just take it easy on yourself. Realize that you're going to have slow moments. I think it's those slower times where it makes you amped when you actually have a really good time um, and try to remember those good times. My dad's always had some good advice where to not get too carried away on the really good moments and not get too depressed on the really bad moments. Just take everything with, with appreciation. Try to keep it even keel. And um, I think that helps you out mentally with getting through the, the tough times. Cool. Um, I, I truly think that we don't give ourselves enough grace. Like we're harder on ourselves than anyone else could be on us. 
So when you don't get the listing or you don't get your offer accepted, I've allowed myself to feel those feelings like I deserve to feel upset, right? And I'm not going to let it consume me because I know what that looks like. And so I give myself a time frame. Like, let's say I lost a listing on Monday. I'll give myself until Friday because I don't want to screw up my whole weekend and my whole week being upset. I'll say I'll allow myself to feel these feelings until Friday. And then after that, I'm going to pick my boots up. I'm going to start analyzing maybe why I didn't get that listing. Maybe have Aaron look at my listing presentation or appear and start figuring out what could I have done different, right? And tell myself, I'm not going to win them all. So like, why get upset about every single one? And that goes back to the having money and saving so that every deal isn't a heartache if you don't get it. Like, I think it kind of goes back to that, but we all have feelings. So like, allow yourself to feel those feelings, but don't let it consume you. Um, I also think that we walk around allowing our feelings to be everything that we are. I'm sad, I'm depressed, I'm happy. That's making like your whole person what you're feeling instead of saying, I'm feeling happy today. I'm going to be depressed this week because I lost a listing. It's just a shift in mindset so that I'm not making my whole being upset or depressed. That's great, Amy. Um, the, I mean, like my biggest takeaway of that is you, that you have boots. That's crazy. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You don't have boots? I knew it. I was like, there's that. You can't. You're like, I'm going to pick up my boots. Like, what boots are you picking up? Because you don't own boots. <laughs> what boots? Uh, and once you said that, I, I lost everything else you said after that. I kept thinking, where are the boots that Amy has? Like, does she have? I was like, yeah, it's not your. Yeah, like I'm trying to picture what kind of boots they'd be. But no, I think that's great. That's great. That's like great. Uh, that's uh, I love the thought of shifting that from like, like, like saying who you are versus like this is a moment and then putting a deadline to that that's really powerful so, Kylie anything you want to add um, I have to say I think most people in this room are, are communicators so I always feel better if I'm able to go to lunch with someone grieve it out get it out and then start over you're grieving lunch I'm grieving it I'm grieving it's that like you're listing grieving and eating. Yeah. where's your go-to restaurant where, where are the grief restaurants like if we see you at a restaurant there are certain ones that are like your go-to <laughs> wherever serves red wine I'll red wine <laughs> So not like a dollar menu place, <laughs> not a dollar menu. So red wine, that's the place. Okay. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Um, I think that's interesting. I mean, I think that's like, that's, it's good to know that you guys, I mean, obviously people see your successes, right? It's not hard to like look on the MLS and see all the homes you're selling. And, and I remember as a newer agent, like I got in like this weird tailspin. Like I would, I would look online and I would see like how successful other people were. And I'd be like, oh man, like I'm so off. Like I see all the things that they're doing and I'm thinking, well, I must be doing something wrong because I'm not, like I feel like I'm working hard, but like how come they're doing so well and I'm not? And it was like this weird gap and it was like, it put me in this weird mental spiral where I kind of felt this. Cause I think that's a hard spot where a lot of people, like a lot of people will, like we compare our, we compare our worst versus the best that we see in other people. So we see the best in other people, whether they sell solar in Florida or whether they, wherever they're at, like you see like the best of other people are doing and then we kind of compare it to our worst and we're like, oh, we're, I'm so far off from all this stuff. Um, well, I think that's, that's good, good advice that you guys are, are sharing. I just have to say, I love that Aaron said that because it's not like I haven't needed pep talks and I love that I can call this man right here and get a pep talk. And you have, he said that to me before. He's like, keep in mind, you're comparing your worst to other people's best. Like if you can really like feel that and hear it, that's really what we all do on social media. So when you're at your worst, you're going to see everyone else's best and you need to remind yourself like that's a real thing that you're feeling, but that's actually not accurate and kind of shift that mindset. But I love. Yeah, I think yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky world, right? Because I mean, in real estate, like we're all on social, like you're kind of on that. I mean, you guys do. I mean, I'm on MySpace. You guys do your stuff, but. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> but like everybody's on so like you're doing stuff and you're trying to position yourself and you're trying to show. And we've had a weird world over the last couple of years where in the last couple of years, like you didn't have to be any good at all. And you could put a sign in front of a house. You had 37 showings. You sold it for more than like full price. You put it and you have a post like I'm killing it. And like, and like you had like posts and be like, holy cow, like you're so good. Like, I know. I don't know. I've listed it and it sold. And like it just. And so now we're in a world like, oh, it's not selling that fast. And you have agents who've got their license in the last couple of years and they're like, well, what am I doing wrong? Because I did the same thing I did before. I put a sign out in front, I put it on the MLS, I put in the remarks, reviewing all offers by Monday. <laughs> But no one's coming to look at it. Like, why is my is my verbiage wrong? Are my photos wrong? And so, so you guys have been through the like, various t- types of markets. And so, what advice would you give to someone who's kind of maybe had their license the last couple of years and they're like now stepping into this market? Like, what would you what would you suggest to them as they're like moving through this different change with working with clientele and the, the shift around that? realizing that it takes more effort to be a realtor today. Like Aaron just said, it just seemed pretty easy the last few years. And so, for example, I just spent four grand listing a house my own out of my own pocket in 23 years. I've never done that. Um, it just, it takes more effort and sometimes it takes spending money to make money, right? Like I see the value in spending a few thousand dollars on a $2.8 million listing. I'll do that all day, every day. And I'll go to every single showing because I know most about that house. When a couple of years ago, maybe I wouldn't have done that because I knew that the house was going to sell today. I'm the expert on my listing. So I will like take the extra time to nurture that listing, to be at every showing, because once again, I know everything about that house behind the walls. So I really, in theory, even if a buyer's agent is there, I will be the one that sells that house um, just with my expertise. So I would just, I would really say, because it takes more effort to be a realtor, you should be the expert in every aspect of your business, meaning neighborhoods, schools, like you, if you get that opportunity to get a listing appointment, you should feel confident walking in that you are the neighborhood expert because you've done all the research. It just takes more effort to be a realtor. We all have a little bit more free time on our hands. So do what it takes to become the expert. Yeah, I love that advice. I think we, uh, we were all very spoiled during COVID. It was just like fishing with dynamite. It's so easy to get deals done. And uh, we di- we can kind of just wing it. But in this market and presumably in future markets, uh, you just have to uh, work harder and that's good. I think it's important to, one well, of my favorite sayings is competence breeds confidence. If you're competent in what you're doing, then you will exude lots of confidence. And that comes down, I'd say my niche, like I mentioned earlier, are rental properties. And I do some property management while my wife handles the majority of it, where I know exactly where rents are in each city that we work in. And I'm extremely confident when my client comes to me and asks, hey Gooch, what could I get for rent in this property? I know exactly what it would rent for as is. I know what it will rent for once they pump $15,000 into renovations. Um, And they feel that confidence. So fine tuning yourself while things are slow to really become confident in in your craft. So if that's not listening to, to music when you're driving anymore and just being silent, and just listening, just thinking through things in your head of how you can perfect yourself or listen to audiobooks. I think Bigger Pockets podcast is awesome. That's like my audio Bible where I just listen to that nonstop and um, other things just to fine tune your craft. So when it comes game time, you're ready to, to really crush it. Is that David Green? Yeah. Yeah. I've met David Green. He's amazing. You should follow that podcast. Also, uh, I stalked these guys' social before we got here, and they have amazing social media, so I would highly recommend you jump on. Um, I would say credibility is not given, especially if you're dealing with like an online lead. So you have to have that education and intellect to back everything up. 
Um, I would also say diversifying your business so you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Where are you getting the business from? So prospect, sphere, um, referrals. If you need to go meet a divorce attorney, um, if you want to specialize in probate, whatever it is, diversify your business so that you're not so susceptible to economic shifts like this. Um, that's going to help you be a lot more consistent and ultimately grow your business bigger, faster. So if, if people in this room were like to shadow you for shadow you for a day, if like somebody was like, hey, I just want to hang out with you. I just want to see what you do. Like what's a typical day in the life of like what would what would be some of the things that would be in your mind? Like oh, this is what I do, but it's like not super exciting. Like are there are certain things that are that you do that like are always on your schedule. That you're like this is very um, this I'm very religious around this. Or these are my non-negotiables that you always do. And is there something that would be surprising? That people are like, I can't, I can't believe you do that. Like, is that something that you still do, and that you uh, you're religious around that too? Like, you you're consistent with this thing that you do. So, like in the day of lot, in, in your typical day or a typical week, what what are some different patterns and habits that you have with your schedule? That if someone were just to shadow you around, or if a film crew was to follow you around for a day, like what would be the things they'd be like? This is gonna be kind of boring, but I do this all the time, and this is a difference maker for me. Or here's some of the things that you'll never believe this, but I this actually works for me, and I do this too yeah i like to think that i'll never have a tv show because my life is very boring when it comes to you know my day-to-day -day work um that's i've had a few uh, little mentors or uh kids in college that wanted to i say kids i was just in college 10 years ago so <laughs> i can't say that but just uh internships that um shadowed me around i'd say majority of the time was spent just on emails and just texting and, and calling people but i'd say one uh piece of advice goes along with the friendship thing where something where they might be surprised that i do are just little random things so if i have a friend who just had a baby my go-to thing is i guess depending on the mood but like i'll send them I'll, I'll hand personally drop off like 60 Red Bulls on their doorstep. <laughs> I'll do a hundred diapers or if I know they don't, maybe aren't into like energy drinks, I'll drop off, um, you know, Minky blanket, something on their, on their doorstep with a letter saying, you know, I'm amps that you just had your child. Good luck. You know, something like that. Um, if it's their birthday, uh, give them a shout out, maybe send them some money for dinner. Um, something very uh subtle i never try to approach it as a real estate thing i never want to you know but i think when you create those genuine solid friendships um people notice it and remember it and uh so i'd say that's like the unique thing that i do in my day-to-day -day throughout the week just so, little find so you're little, dropping off little gifts like little like you're finding different things that you can do yeah just, what, are, what are some of the most unique things that you've dropped off or things that are kind of outside the norm that you've dropped off man um i'm kind of a consistent guy to be honest i don't right. well, so I don't what are the, what, like so the baby the baby thing is probably, a consistent one yeah that you probably do. probably the the minky blankets and and red bulls are kind Pretty of my, consistent my staple yeah that's cool <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not too creative i i just think of one thing and just you know <laughs> right, just, auto pay on that so if we see you at the store buying a bunch of red bulls we know where you're off <laughs> you know, to yeah you know yeah yeah exactly that's good i think you'd be surprised uh it's kind of hectic, right? Um, Aaron always says, like, what are your systems? And I always make the joke, oh, I've just been lucky for 23 years being a realtor. I don't have real systems. But he's like, Amy, you have systems. You just don't have them written down. So, like, something that I do is I remember every single house almost that I've sold for 23 years. Like I can literally drive to it. I might not remember the people, but I remember the house. And um, so if I do remember who they are, I will send them a text and just say, hey, I was out showing homes or out in your area and I just drove by your house, just made me think of you and I had to say hi. So it's totally not salesy. If I'm driving by a house that I sold, I'm thinking about that transaction. It's not a lie, it's not salesy and I have so many clients that are like, oh my gosh, it's been forever since I've talked to you. How are you doing? Like the whole thing about being a realtor is staying top of mind to the, your clients or your SOI. So it's just a nice way to say, I was thinking about you. Like I remember you. Um, I also 
like this isn't a daily thing, but at the brokerage, we're able to order like discount Mother's Day flowers. Like that is huge that I can hand deliver 75 to 100 bouquets of flowers. Like I've made mothers cry like every year, at least a couple of them cry and say, oh my gosh, my husband didn't even give me flowers. So yeah. like I, I'm i literally helping the husband out and to the wife. And yeah. so it's full there service. you go, right. And so really, I just think it's like, making sure that you're reaching out to people. And I feel super uncomfortable calling people like Aaron knows that's kind of a little weakness for me is calling people because I don't love to be called at night on my off time. So I feel weird doing that to someone else. Um, but it's super like non evasive to send a text that you're just thinking about them. So that's something like I try and at least do that um, a couple times a week. I'm just I'm doing the math in my head on that. So 75 to 100 bouquets and you work with a lot of divorced couples mm -hmm. with right. the flowers that you're delivering. <laughs> right. You're creating drama between the husband and the wife. <laughs> Uh, super strategic. Right. I'm just and kidding. I'm just kidding. Guys, that's not, that is not, that's not. I have a lot of out. clients that are like dog moms that aren't married, no. and I make sure that they get a bouquet of flowers, and I cross out and I put dog mama on it. And so, like once again, it's about like staying in touch with your clients, and that's a way that I feel comfortable doing that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've done the same. I just I give it to the guys. So I always like I send the text message to the guys I'm like, hey, it's Mother's Day in two days. Um, in case you didn't remember. And I'm sure you don't have flowers yet. So swing by the office like I can hook you up. And like every single guy's like, they're always super excited. They're always every guy is like, dude, that's amazing. Like, well, it comes up every year. It's not that hard. Like it's it's not it's not that tricky. But like I but I'll have like, I usually just have the flowers at my house or at the office and there's like a stream of guys that come through grabbing flowers and then I'm like, don't give me credit. Do not say this is coming from me because that's super awkward <laughs> if you pass these on to your, yeah. So yeah. Your, your wife has the most beautiful flowers, by the way. Oh, my wife's amazing. I can't, I can't buy her flowers. <laughs> I'm like, I it doesn't. They're gorgeous. So I, we're very system oriented at my office. So I have a client management system. I review that every morning. I watch um, and listen to what my agent's calls look like. And then I guess one thing that I always, I do most times is I like to have lunches. So with vendors, affiliates, people I like, my agents, I just love to connect and see how their lives are and what's going what's new with them what's going on so i just like to take people to lunch and socialize that's cool that's and so that, that you you glanced over really fast but you said that you so you listen to the calls of some of your team members how does that go like what like say a little bit more about that you got so they call off of a system and a process and then you're the recorded calls and you're listening in on that and then yeah, how does that work so then I, it gives me an opportunity to give them dialogue or feedback like okay here's where i would have said this or this is probably the way i would have presented that as opposed to just being so direct so it helps them in the long, long term form their own system and way that they handle those phone calls as they come in. So yeah, I see how everything's working out. Have you noticed a difference in your agents because they know that they're being held accountable to that? Have, there, have, they, have you seen their level of com conversion? They're shaking their heads. Yeah, they're shaking their heads. I mean, it's real, right? Because like, you, and if you know she's listening in, you can't be like, and if somebody says anything, if they're like, I can't believe you work with Kylie. Like, I know she's the best. We love her. <laughs> like, and because you know she's going to listen to it, right? So you're like, no, I'm just kidding. But, but in the end, like, there's something about being accountable around that. So, so well, they're honing their trade, and I feel like this this uh, market currently is is pushing us to level up the professionalism. So they need to get a lot of information in the client's ears in a very short amount of time. And so they need to know how to, to get it out. That's cool. Okay. So here's my stumper question for you guys. If you were to just have to pack up and move to a different state, whether it's Florida or whatever state it is, and you had to move to a new state and you got your, you had your real estate license and you're up and running. What would you do to start out? in your first six months to get to start to gain traction in your business, knowing what you know now and knowing if you had to start over in a new, in a new market, what would you, what would be your go-to processes to get, to get up, up, up off the ground? I think we've said this 15 times, but it's a relationship industry. So how would you do that? But if you're in a new place and you, you like don't you know anybody someone yet. to groom your dog, you need someone to color your hair. I need someone to do my lashes. Um, 
I need to go get groceries somewhere. You're just gaining relationships everywhere you go. Personally, I feel like this is the era of the team. So if you're a brand new agent, I would find I would find a company that has a team that has a very wide community presence um, that you can really gain more relationships through through the company. They've already got that their legs out, their roots out. And so then you just basically are like a leaf on the tree, right? And you kind of piggyback on the stuff that that's already been being done. So you're not starting from scratch, in my opinion. Got it. <laughs> Mike, you've kind of done this when you came up here to Utah. Yeah. Right? I mean, that was... Yeah, that was it. <clears throat> I'd say... Um, it's funny you say this because I, I thought about this just randomly the other day. What if I were to move to New York? Like, how would my, how would I do real estate? It gave me so much anxiety because I, I just knew I wouldn't be as successful there as I am here. And I'd say the main difference is that I went to school here. So, um, majority of my friends <coughs> sorry, are still living here. And that has been absolutely pivotal. So, not to like, you know, be a dead horse, but I'd say, nourishing your friendships the the approach that i take is on instagram you guys should look at my account it's nothing to brag about i think i have like maybe 1500 followers if that i'm not trying to go viral with any of my posts my whole focus on instagram is just to follow as many of my friends as possible and and just provide little inserts of information to remind them each week or a couple times a week that I'm in real estate. And then they'll just see in the back of their mind, at least if it's once or twice a week that, okay, Gooch is real estate. When I have a friend who needs to buy a property or sell, or when I'm in the market, they will think of me. And that is the only way I get business. Like every, every client I get has either come from real, from my Instagram or they have referred their friends, um, from Instagram. So whatever that, you know, is maybe if you're younger and TikTok's your grind, or if you're older and Facebook's where majority of your friends are at, um, I think you just hone on that and just uh, really emphasize. So if I were to move to New York and do it all over, I would follow the dog groomer on Instagram. I would follow my hair, my hairstylist on Instagram. Um, barber probably for me, <laughs> I guess they're not called stylists for men. Um, I'd follow them all on Instagram. I would, I also comment on people's stuff. And then again, I do it in a very genuine way, but when they're in Hawaii, people only post stuff because they want attention at the end of the day. That's really what it comes down to. So when they're in Hawaii, I say, Hey man, that vacation looked awesome, looked looked incredible. I wish I was there, like, you know, I'm, I'm happy for you. Or they had a baby, you compliment on, on that. Just interact with people and then they appreciate it and then they'll pay more attention to the things you post. And um, so, yeah, that's what I do if I move to New York, to interact on social media. Cool. So I definitely like echo what these two said. Um, I was thinking about, I did move here without knowing more than one person. Um, and it is like a tricky thing to navigate and you're in a relationship business. So like I would set a goal to hand out 10 business cards a day. Somebody told me that a long time ago and I never really did it. But I think if I moved someplace else and had to start out from scratch, I think that's actually a really cool thing. You go to the gym, like we all conversate with the guys at the desk or, or whoever, like there's just a lot of opportunity to get your name out there. Um, and then I was thinking like also just being a joiner, there's single mom groups, there's like all different kinds of groups that you, whether it's online or in person that you could join. Um, when I moved here, I, I wasn't part of the predominant religion. And so, and then I was a single mom when I got my real estate license or going into that phase of my life. And so I didn't feel like I had any kind of network here. And it just took one person trusting me and believing in me that I could sell their house. And it gave me that little boost of confidence. Okay, I can do this. And if you have motivation, like you're a single mom, like 
like I was. You can't lose. Like this was what I decided to do to get out of my situation. So I was going to move mountains to make sure that this worked for me. And so I would imagine I'd feel the same if I moved to another state and it was like make or break. I'm used to making X amount of dollars. I want to do that again. So what do I need to do to join, whether it's a team or whatever it is in that area to start meeting new people, possibly getting leads, um, like going through that process again. That's what I would say. Cool. Um, guys, we're going to have a chance for you guys to uh, come up with your own questions and ask. I have one more question for you guys, and we'll open it up. So you guys, if you want to think about a question that you want to, might want to ask, um, you're welcome to do that in a second. So here's my, my, my last question before we kind of open it up to the masses. Are you ready? Um, so a lot of times people will look at where you're at and they'll look at it and say, okay, you guys are so successful. You're doing really, really well. Um, what I have found is that it's always interesting to hear about the biggest obstacles that you had to get to where you're currently at. So everybody has different obstacles that they've had to bust through or break through or whatever that thing was that was maybe it's like a, a, like a maybe it's a mindset that you had or maybe it was a certain like thing in your business where you're like, I just, there was this thing I kept coming up against that if you look back on the, the course of your real estate career, like what was the thing that was like the breakthrough for you to get to, to, to the other side? I know for me, and I'll, as you guys are kind of thinking about that, um, like I grew up in a house where like my dad was from Eureka, Utah, like a small mining town, graduating class of 14. Um, at Tintic High. He would brag about how, how he made the basketball team. I'm like, how you, I hope so. There's like 14 people. It's 14 people in your graduating class. Like, if you don't make that basketball team, that's pretty sad. So I think half of the 14 were like were girls. So I'm like, I, if you can't make the guy's team out of... Um, but like my dad grew up working in the mines. Like he worked his way through the mines and then he like went to law school. And then I grew up back east in New Jersey. And... Um, so in our family, it was always like this mindset of like you like you work hard. So money comes in direct proportion to the effort that you put out. So I grew up in a, in a household where you had to work hard. Like we just like we learned how to work hard. That was like that was the mindset that we always had. And I have tons of stories about all the battles I had with my parents as a teenager, like trying to like not have to work and then then making us work as they would call it family privileges that's what they call it because the privilege to eat and a privilege to live there so we have family privileges every saturday um <laughs> that's great this is the best but i learned how to work hard like that was like a, so when i got into real estate i thought you know what i'm just gonna work super super hard and i figured that i'm just gonna make it successful for me to be like make that work um and I would say over the course of time, like that worked really well. Like I got to a certain place where I could close a lot of transactions, but I also was working really, really hard. And one of the big, the shifts and breakthroughs for me was, and it came like through some mental breakthroughs and uh, the different coaches and mentors. And it was that you can make money working smart and not just hard. And that was like a transformative moment in my business. Like that was a moment that shifted dramatically because then it became how can I increase my income working less time because for years I'd feel guilty not working like I felt guilt around like oh I'm not working hard but it was like how, how can I work smarter how can I work smarter and I can increase my income working less and less and less and it's still a battle like because like I grew up in this like household of like you have to work hard and so I still can work I can out, I can work pretty hard but I have to like dial that back to work really, really smart. And that was like a transformative process. Um, and it really pushed my business to whole different levels. And so for you guys, are there certain like mindsets that you had maybe growing up that you've had, or maybe certain things that you had to kind of break through to get to where you're currently at right now? Yes, for sure. Uh, for sure. I think mindset is huge. Um, going back to my childhood, I, I realized older that I grew up in a scarcity mindset, right? Like I watched my parents live paycheck to paycheck. So that's the opposite of what I wanted to do. And here I am self-employed just like they were, right? And so, so looking at not wanting to be the total stress case that my mom always was, um, made me have to reflect inside and like start peeling those layers of childhood trauma back to figure out like how can I change that mindset like give myself more grace and not live in scarcity instead shift that to gratitude and abundance like there's not a day that I pull out of my garage that I'm not 
telling myself, I'm so grateful that I have this badass car that I get to ride in, that I have this beautiful house. I freaking love our lot. We will never leave. It's perfect for me. And I tell myself things like that all day long. Even when a client calls me or texts me, I get off the phone and think to myself, you're so lucky that your clients want to go out to lunch with you. It's such a different mindset to live in gratitude and abundance instead of, oh my gosh, when am I, when am I going to close another deal? Like, and just stress out about every aspect of your life. So that shift happened for me just in the last few years. And I, I truly think that I exude more confidence now because I'm not living in scarcity. I'm consistently living in gratitude for everything that I have. Awesome. Yeah, I'd That's say awesome. um, for me, sorry, I don't know why I have this junk in my, my throat. Um, one of my favorite mentors who has since passed is Gordon Hinckley. And he said that uh, you need to forget yourself. And that has been pivotal for me in this industry is to um, think less about myself and more for my client. You know, it can be Saturday evening. It could be your birthday. Like my birthday was a week ago. I didn't tell any of my clients. I did the most tours in one day for on my birthday. I think it was 16 tours. We walked through 16 homes on my birthday. And um, I don't know. You just have to forget yourself and just do stuff for your clients. And I think that's how you really succeed. I, I read this book from Grant Cardone, uh, 10X, and he talks about in there how, um, you know, some people don't work on Sunday. And he makes a joke that, you know, God only took a, a break on Sunday because he created the entire earth those six other days. He can take a day off. So for us, you know, I had a, a agent the other day said that she she doesn't work on Sunday, and I respect that to each their own. I'm, I'm definitely not going to dog on that. Um, but if a client needs something on a Sunday, I think it's imperative that you forget yourself and try to go and then help them out. That might be an unpopular belief, and you know, I <laughs> I understand that. But for me, just to go along that with forgetting yourself is just whatever it takes. If it's inconvenient for you to do it, I think your clients will appreciate it and we'll, uh, we'll pay it forward down the line. I think the hardest thing in my entire career was coming to the conclusion I was actually a salesperson. I quit my job and I told my husband and he said, but you're not a salesperson. And I don't feel like I still even look at myself as a salesperson. I feel like I enjoy everything I do every day and I make amazing relationships and I love watching the different dynamics in people's marriages. I love watching how they handle their finances. I think it's so interesting and I still don't see myself as a salesperson, but that's my job. Okay, so what, what questions do you guys have? Any questions you guys have that you wanna ask the panel or, yeah. Yeah, good question. So we initially did it for our properties and then branched it off to, since I'm helping clients acquire properties, I've uh, been doing it for them. We haven't uh, intentionally marketed it to get more clients. We, it's a tough industry, but the approach that we took is that I realized that most property managers are also realtors and that I didn't want to let any hot foxes in the hen house in a sense where I help my clients acquire property maybe it's three, six months until they're ready to acquire another one. So I don't, might not keep that good communication with them. But then this property manager that they're using talks to them every, at least once a month when they're sending them the bill. And my fear was that, okay, this property manager will eventually have a better relationship with my client and will eventually steal them and, uh, and start using them for business. So to mitigate that, my wife was kind enough to <laughs> be willing to take the, the brunt of that way of being the property manager where I acquired the business and um, do the majority of like the oversight, but she handles the, the behind the scenes stuff. Did you have a mentor that helped you get into property management? Like how did you go from being an agent to saying, oh, well, I'm a property manager 
Yeah. Awesome. Oh wow, that's the hardest. Yeah, I say you're doing the hardest one, short term. That's that's difficult, very time consuming. Awesome. Um, I'd say stick with that niche then, because I think a lot of people are are scared of it. I'm scared of short term <laughs> rental. Um, but I'd say mentor wise is more trial and error with with our property um just learning the basics of it and then i think really at the end of the day if you have a really good handyman maybe two that could tackle stuff if one's not working that day or is too busy that day if you just have a good property man or a good handyman that's the the brunt of it Cause the majority of things that come down are that's inconvenient it's just that there's issues with the home you then call the handyman they go and fix it and then your job is just to communicate with the tenant and make sure that they pay rent on time um it's not as daunting as you might think i think you just find a good handyman i have some great recommendations if you need some you cool got yeah like when you found your business in like a plateau right and you're like okay i'm happy here like two questions like how do you avoid staying comfortable we're like oh, this, this is good i don't know how to do more like, how do you break into the discomfort? And like, what was sort of the difference maker in your business when you did go from like, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable here, but to get to the next level, what was it that you sort of did? Was that mindset? Was it staff? What was that? Let's take it. <laughs> so I'd say seven years ago, we invested in a CRM. And my current brokerage at the time did not want to invest in the CRM with me. So I shelled out big bucks every month to have this platform that gave me a website. And back then you could do real estate without a website, right? I guess you still can. Um, but this was like cutting edge. This was new. And so I was taking a huge risk and we would we started soliciting online leads. And that was terrifying, like completely whole new ball game. I had to relearn the job completely because I was completely accustomed to referral based income. Um, I have to say, I'm one that as soon as I master it, I have to figure out something else. Like I can never sit still. So I think that's personal drive and determination. I think you just are, I think if you're gonna be successful and work at a high level, you have to have that. And I would recommend the book, The One Thing by Gary Keller, because it kind of keeps you focused and it explains that kind of personality trait. So if you haven't read it, you should totally read that. Um, but I think that, yeah, you will become stagnant if you're not educating yourself and trying to push forward. I, I just think mindset for me personally, I, um, I didn't have all this confidence to go into these over $2 million properties. And I couldn't figure out why, but I had to figure out where that was coming from. Like what inside me didn't feel confident to work with this caliber of people. And it took a little bit of coaching from Aaron, like some good pep talks from my husband, and then really just working through, once again, the childhood trauma that I didn't come from money. And so I didn't feel like I fit in with money. And um, so like I really have shifted. And in the last few years, I've totally broke into that over one and a half, two million dollar price point. And I love that I walk in with so much confidence, but not cockiness. Um, there's a fine balance. And so mindset for me, like really for me, everything has been internal. I'm the one that holds myself back. I have the power to change that. So once you realize that you have the power to be and act and feel how you really want to feel the best version of yourself, I think that that shifts everything in your business, in your personal life, like every aspect. Yeah, I mean, and, and Amy, like she, there's been, it's been transformative. She's always been really, really successful. I mean, for many, many years. But the growth behind that, like to see her step into that has been really fascinating to watch because like she got to a place where she was comfortable, but then she was uncomfortable being comfortable. <laughs> So like, so everybody's like, I want to be comfortable. Like, but you don't because you're not comfortable. So you, you, there's a place where you're like, there's this other version of you that's like, yeah, but we're, we, there's like the, the present view and the future you. 
And the present you is like the current, all the past version of you has gone to this level right here. And then you're like, it's good, but it's like not where you want to end up. And there's this other version that's like fighting it out. And it's like, because there's a future version of you that's like, we could do way more. But in the present, she's like, yeah, but we're okay right now. We're good. And like, it justifies everything that's going on. It justifies we've got money and we're good. And we're, I've, got, I've got everything else. Like, it will justify all the reasons why not to change because it doesn't want to change. But then there's the other part of you that's like, mm, but we want to change. Like there's like, we, we can do more. We can accomplish. And then Amy went through that battle. Like she was like, it's a, but it was an internal battle. It was like this. Two, these two, and then for some people, they just like, they're able to like quiet the future version of them so much that they're, they'll just stay where they're currently at. And they'll just like, they'll just justify it for as long as they want to go. But for a lot of people, especially in our industry, because your, your business grows as you grow, that at a certain level, you're like, I'm just, I, can, I, can, I know I can do more. But doing more means that that you've got to do some inner work to like m- take to, to take it to the next level, and, which is really awkward. Be uncomfortable. Like I have learned that amazing things happen on the other side of uncomfortable. So like I actually almost welcome the uncomfortable where the old version of me would stay away from the uncomfortable. So like the biggest growth is when you get on the other side of uncomfortable. Yeah, there's some power behind that. And the and the marketplace right now creates so many moments of uncomfortable. And they, and you can like step into that. And that's like that that's the doorway to growth and the doorway to the other side. But a lot of people are just gonna look at that and like, eh, no thanks. And that's what the majority of agents in our industry are gonna do. They're gonna wanna stay as comfortable as they can and they're gonna wanna like just tone it down and step back. But you guys are all people that have like stepped through that. And like you come across uncomfortable, like, all right, it's just like, a, it's just a, you guys have like a change of address to live in uncomfortable. Like you guys are used to it, right? I mean, like, like being uncomfortable is like, we're used to that. And you guys make it look easy for the outside, for the outside world. To, I mean, you guys are like, whether well, watch, like you, like you can see how easy you guys make it. But on the inside, you're like, it's not that easy, right? Like there's like some hard parts around that too. Cool. That's a great question, Ali. Um, any other thoughts? Any other or any other? Yeah, Ryan. Is, uh, are any on seller finance? What are your biggest challenges as it relates to seller finance? Seller finance. Seller finance. Yeah, I, I've done like two in twenty three years, and they were really big when I got my license, and I just didn't do them. So, I, I think it's a good like niche to get into, um, but I don't know. Yeah. I, my brother-in-law is really good at them. So if, if you need someone to talk to about it, I can get you in touch with him. But yeah, I, I suck at them. I, haven't <laughs> <laughs> I find most, most buyers want to sell our finance with 2000 down. So that's the problem I see. Down payment is a big, big It's the same with assumable loans. It's like the thought of doing them would be amazing for so many of our clients. And now after COVID, you need a hundred plus thousand dollars to buy anyone out of their loan to get their low interest rate. So it's like, in theory, I want to do them. I advertise, but I just don't do them a lot. Yep. That brings up another question. What's the conversation you're having with those people that are saying, I'm in sub 3%. I'm never moving. These seven and a quarter rates. Like, I mean, how are you tackling that, that challenge? Hmm. Because a lot of agents are like, yeah, nobody's moving. Like, I, it's just the market is slow. But yet your businesses have continued to do well. So how are you, you tackling that? That's a good question. Do you guys want to go with that? Yeah, no, it's <clears throat> it's really tough. Um, I, I advise my clients never to sell. I, I just talk to so many owners, especially rental properties, where 30 years from now, they just look like absolute geniuses because they've held them for so long. And at the time when they bought them, they said they thought they were overpaying for them and they thought they were stupid, but now there's you know, geniuses. So when it comes to them having that 3% interest rate, I just tell them, that if they can just hold on to it and find another home or if they need to do a refinance, well, I guess that defeats, defeats the purpose. Um, maybe a HELOC to make it work. Um, but it is tough. Yeah, I think in this market, the majority of those buyers are 
only leveling up if it's out of necessity and their home is too small and they need something bigger and then that's why they're selling. But I think most of the time people are just kind of hanging tight. I, I was just going to say, I'm not here to pressure anyone to sell their house, right? So like a lot of my phone calls are them calling me asking me like, is this a good time? Or we're going through this. What does this look like for us? A lot of my clients like rely on me to help them make big financial decisions. And something that I have done my whole career being a realtor is I do not give advice that I wouldn't give my own family member. So my clients all know that that's the headspace that I'm coming from. It's not that Amy needs to close another deal. It's that like, what is talk to me about why you would move. Like, why is this opening up for you? I find I almost end up being a therapist slash life coach slash financial planner slash whatever else. And so I let them tell me why they're even thinking about selling. And then let's have a real conversation about what that looks like. Um, I helped someone buy a townhouse in Lehigh a few years ago. And they called me last year and they're like, hey, we think that we want to sell, but rates had just went up. So I met with them and said, hey, like, talk to me. Why do you want to sell? The whole reason why they wanted to sell was because they wanted to buy another property. And so I just worked it all out, helped them get a HELOC, grabbed their down payment, showed them how to have that as a rental. And then they still bought another house with me. But they actually appreciated that I wasn't like, ooh, sell. You just got to sell. Like, there are other ways to do it, not for everyone but once again when you're coming from a place of caring about your clients over your own needs it comes across that way and i think they really appreciate it so so question of the group how many of you feel that this is a good time to buy a house a couple of you right how many of you feel it's a bad time to buy a house nobody wants to like, i'm not gonna raise in this room you're like i don't want to be judged um <laughs> I think that I, I was, I was, as you were answering that question, as you answer, asked that, I thought, I don't know if there ever is a good or bad time. Like, I don't know if there ever is a good time to buy. And like, because like, even in the last couple of years, there were struggles that people had to buy. It's not like every single person you worked with bought a house. They all had their own challenges. Like two years ago, it, did every single buyer you had buy a house? No. Three years ago, did every single buyer in your pipeline buy a house? No. Like my, They'd be like, well, I don't have enough of this. And the, the market's too fast. So I'm going to wait for this. There's always excuses why not to buy. And there's always going to be reasons why people are going to hold off buying. Because if it was always easy, everybody would buy. But not everybody buys. It's, there's never been a market in my 20 plus years that I've ever seen every single person who's bought a house that want to buy a house. There's never been a time, ever. People like, there's always going to be people like, eh, it's not a good time. And there are always going to be times when it's not good. And I would say that our ability to work with people to help them make hard decisions and to move forward is going to be what is the difference maker. Because in the end, there is not a single one of my clients for the last 20 years who calls me mad that they bought a house. Not, I don't have anybody from five years ago who's like, hey, Aaron, I'm so ticked still that I bought a house at this price. Or from 10 years ago, I don't have anybody come like, hey, 10 years ago, you made us buy this house for $200,000. Like, yeah, you're welcome. Oh, yeah. Like, no one's mad about buying a house from 10, 15, 20 years ago. But what, what, what regret cre is created is from the people who never bought. Nobody regrets buying. People regret not buying. And like we're in a room, I guarantee every one, this, every one of us on this panel has had listings that were like, dude, if I could buy that house today, I would have bought that in a heartbeat. Like we've all listed homes that have like gone through, like we were at the house, we like helped them price it. We're like, all right, well, we'll hope you sell this. That if we could go back in time, we'd be like, you know what? I am your number one buyer. I will buy this house today. If I look back at all the listings that like, I'm like, holy cow, I can't believe I like put a sign out in front of that and try to find a buyer because I should have bought that house. I should have bought that one. I should have bought, bought every single listing I had from 10 years ago. But the question is in 10 years from now, we're, it'll, be, it'll be 2033. And you'll be like, good night. Remember those prices in 2023? Those were killer. But it's still good. But it's the mindset of the people in today's market that feels like it's this stretch because it just feels like it's outside their comfort zone. And so the question that Ali asked earlier about getting outside our comfort zone, like if you can't work with yourself 
to help understand how to get out of your own comfort zone to like move forward, you're gonna have a really hard time helping other people get out of their comfort zone. Because I would say that in today's market, every single buyer has to be outside their comfort zone to a certain extent. They have to. But if you're like, you know what, you should buy when it's really easy for you, you will never sell a house. Because it's never easy. Right? I mean, whether it's like even if the rates, even if the rates drop super low tomorrow to two percent, what do you think is gonna happen to the prices? Do the prices are gonna stay the same? Price would skyrocket. And then all of a sudden, all the buyers who are waiting for 2% interest rates are like, oh, I don't have all the money saved up. Like, I, I don't have the, the gap for the appraisal gap. I don't have all the money saved up. I could try to, oh, I just can't afford the new prices. Like, there's going to be new challenges every single time. So it's interesting that we in this industry are always like waiting for this perfect time. I don't know. I don't, I've never found a perfect time. I mean, I've done this a long time. And I've never had any clients who are like perfect. But the only clients that I've ever seen who have timed it perfect are the ones that sold at the peak and moved out of state and they're gone. The only one, because if they sold in our market, they had to buy another, like, I mean, so if they wait for their prices to get high enough, they're gonna have to buy high prices on the other side. But it's gonna be awkward and uncomfortable every single time. And so your ability to work with people who can deal with hard, uncomfortable situations will be critical because every single time it's gonna be uncomfortable. And every single one of my clients I've met with, I'm like, like, what? Should I buy? I'm like, I don't know. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be hard. <laughs> it's it's because it's going to be every single time. They're not. You're not. Like, the numbers are never going to be good. Who likes to pay money out? We live in Utah County. Gosh dang it! <laughs> no one likes to pay money for anything. <laughs> I mean, it's unless it's like a, unless you sold a house through DI Real Estate. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, that'd be a brand. That would be amazing. Um, the yeah, Chrissy, go ahead. Yeah, so piggybacking on the uncomfortable. Um, I'm a very, very new agent, and um, I would like to know how your conversations went when you didn't know the answer. When, uh, yeah, you feel, you know, I, I want to know everything, but I'm not going to know any, everything in a month. So just kind of how you comfortably set that tone. Well, I think when you're new, you have this amazing opportunity to take time and learn the business. Like I would meet with either if you have a financial planner or ask me for mine, like educate yourself on the industry. Educate yourself on what it means when the Fed say that they're going to that they're going to raise interest rates because those are questions that you'll get. So meet with your lender, educate yourself so that if you are in that uncomfortable situation, hopefully you have some kind of information. And if you don't, I think it's okay to say, you know something? I actually don't know that but I will find out for you and I will get back to you with that information. I think the worst is when you just try and bull crap your way through it because everybody can tell. So if you don't know the answer, be honest about it and say, I haven't, I haven't heard that question before. I haven't gotten that before, but I will find out for you. I don't know if that answered yes, your question. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this goes back to finding the right team for you. So our, our preferred lender currently, she's sending out to buyers that are on the fence that they get qualified and they're just not ready to accept the payment, she'll send out a document that she puts together in like a program she has that says the cost of waiting. And so it says, here's your mortgage today. Here's what the house is going to be worth in three years. And then this is what your payment's going to be. And it's always more. So it's like, you're just, you're delaying the inevitable, right? But finding those people, they will educate you. Our association has really amazing classes, great vendors that come and then I would say uh, shadow anyone you possibly can. I love that. Like, I mean, the, the question too is like, if you have people that don't want to buy, can they save fast enough to keep up with the market making adjustments? I mean, like, like well, I'm just going to wait. Like, well, how, how would you wait? Are you going to get a better job? Are you going to like make more money down the road? Because if you're like, I'm just going to save money on the side, there's like, I just don't see anyone saving enough money on their current employment to make up the, the difference of what the market will do over the long term. Like, I just don't, like, I haven't never seen a cover of a magazine come out congratulating a renter for holding off for 10 years and saving money and beating the market. Like, I haven't seen that. Like, congratulations to the Smith family. They decided not to buy, and they saved money, and they beat the market for all you idiots that bought. 
no, like, I've never seen that. Like, I've never seen that, like, happen. But, but I love that, like, the cost of waiting because there is a cost, right? There's a cost of all that stuff. Mike, anything you want to add to that with the people you're dealing with? No, they both nailed it. Cool. All right. Yeah. I have a situation I'm dealing with this week. So I have a longtime friend. I play soccer with him since I was like 10. And I found out through a mutual friend this week, he used a, another agent to buy a house. How would you guys, because right now the first thing I want to do is call him and be like, what the hell is But that's obviously not the best way to handle the situation. How would you guys approach something like that? You can't expect loyalty in this business, 100%. So I, I just suggest that you separate uh, business and personal. It's really hard to do. It's not easy, but you have to. Yeah, I think it happens to all of us, unfortunately. You just lick your wounds and just try to move past it. I think I've been blessed with a terrible memory. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I could just, I try to just phase it out and just not think about it. Um, I had someone wise tell me that you just can't, you're not entitled to everything. And I'm not saying you are. I think it's just easy to fall in the trap that, man, they for sure should have used me, but we never know the full story. You know, it could be that that, nef that cousin all of a sudden got their license and they're tossing them a bone or I don't know, there's, there's a myriad of things. But whenever it happens to me, I try to just chill out and just not get too salty over it. And you stay friends with that person. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's always the thing in the back of your head that, you know, they've, they've, I don't know, screw them. I'm never going to talk to them again. Um, <clears throat> I think you just try to fight it and just pretend it didn't happen or just look past it. But that's very easy, e easy to say, but I'm, I'm with you. I have those same feelings and it, it sucks. It's never, never fun, but try to just look past it. I've done this long enough that that's happened to me. And then I've listed their home and they fought with me. So mm -hmm. I was going to say okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then mm -hmm. earn it, you'll get it back. Yeah. And be the bigger person, right? Like we all expect that our family and friends would and should have loyalty and use us. And like Mike said, you never know what's going on behind the scenes. This has happened to me many times in 23 years. And I still want them as friends. And really deep down, I want to know what it was and why they didn't use me. So my thought is, I'll be the bigger person. At some point, it will come out. But use this as momentum and fire so that next time it won't happen not saying that it was your fault but maybe talk about real estate a little bit more or you know do more posts about working with friends and clients and just things like that so that you're super top of mind but it will happen throughout your career it just will but remember give yourself time to feel your feelings and then get over it that's the only way to move forward yeah. i think you have to have you have to have failure and loss to get better like you'll never improve if you don't have losses. Like you, like I mean, I've become a way better listing agent for all the listings I never got. Right. Like all the clients that didn't end up working with me, like I'm a way better agent because it forced me to get better. Because the other times I would just, I could coast. I'm like, all right, I guess I got it all figured out. But until you start to like have some losses, you're like, oh, you know what? I could probably provide better value. I could probably do more. I could up my game. There's things I can do to be. I think that's like the, just looking at it as an opportunity to be like, all right, well, I guess I got to make sure that all my other friends know that the value I bring so that doesn't happen. It just, it just gives you a chance to become a better version of you. And, and I think all of us have had, we've all gone through like having people that we thought would work with us for sure. People that we, and the, but the, all those opportunities are just chances to come back that much better for the next round. And down the road, like that person, like who knows? Like they could have a terrible experience and then like they're like, all right, well. Or they're terrible totally. clients. They could. Yeah. yeah. But like sometimes people like they're like they're so short sighted. They don't even know they don't even know any better either. Like they might you might think like I can't believe these people did that. And sometimes they're just just dumb. Like they just don't know any better. Cause we didn't we didn't even tell them anything different, right? They just did something because they just followed their impulses and didn't know anything better. So and I guess kinda to quickly add on that too, it's like just because it's so recent, my friend just bought a home recently with another friend, so mutual friends, both realtors. He bought a home with that individual. 
I kept it cool, didn't show my cards, or wasn't salty about it. We still golf and, and do everything. Just yesterday, he referred me, one of his friends, to help his friend buy a home. So it's like if I burnt the bridge and just said, you know, screw you, we're not cool anymore, uh, I wouldn't have this referral who I'm talking to tonight to help him buy a home. So I think just like you're saying, just even keel, just move it, just keep it. Because all real estate is, the way I like to look at it, is just a spider web. Like if you can just not burn any bridges, you'll be amazed by how many people will come out of the woodworks that will refer friends to you. If you can just keep those relationships and harbor them, the more friends you have, the more success you'll have. So, but it's a great question. It's a tough one. Cool. This is good. All right. So, uh, we're kind of at time. Um, I have one final thing I'm going to ask you guys, and we'll call it a, an event. This has been great. What uh, what would be the book you'd recommend? If, you, if people in the room, like, is there a book you've read recently or a podcast that you've listened to or anything that that you like, that was really a good one. Like, this has really been really kind of influential for me. Any any takeaways that you'd give to, to people? And then maybe just wrap up with whatever book it is. There's just whatever final thoughts you have for the group. Do you have a... I already said mine, so I I don't work for KW, but I my one of my coaches recommended I read this book, um, the one thing by Gary Keller. Halfway through, I was like, this is the dumbest book. I don't want to I don't want to read it anymore because it was saying multitasking is not real. And I'm like, hey, I do that better than everybody. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and then as I got reading it, it said. You can multitask, but you're never going to do anything well. Like you're never going to master anything. So you have to choose the one thing that you really want to focus your energy on and master. And as I read the book, the second part of the book, it was like it was like looking in the mirror. It was fantastic, and I loved it. So I recommend that highly. Awesome. I'd recommend too. I can't remember his name nor the book, so you'll have to. <laughs> you'll have to <laughs> that's, a, that's your recommendation. Is just gotta find it out. <laughs> Good luck out there, everybody. It's. <laughs> It's very impactful. I swear it's really good, especially for listings. Like it blew my mind. I've never recommend like this um, is not helping. All right, no. like the, you you talk about how great the book is that we don't know. All right, no, all it's right. not helping. Everybody. I'm giving you, I'm giving you a hint so you can find it. <laughs> it's um his his first name is Gordon, I believe. Jor Jordan, and he's the. <laughs> Jordan something, realtor in California. He's like the number one realtor. Jordan for, Cohen? Yeah. Jordan Cohen. Remax. Yeah. He just came out with a book about listings and that one is incredible. I, I highly recommend that. There's few books where I don't like, I'm not a reader, but that one I can put down. So highly recommend that. Just shifts your view of how to approach listings and has been very, very helpful for me. And then lastly, just because my focus, I feel like is more on relationships is how to win friends or how to influence people. How to win, win friends, friends and influence, influence people. people. Um, that one is like, I'd say the Bible is like my number one book. And then how to win friends and influence people is the next one. Um, just very insightful ways of just how to treat people, how to be kind and how to create more uh, genuine friendships. Um, mine, I can't remember the author, but it's called Awareness. And it's a lot of that, like not making your feelings who you are. Like it's so many aha moments where you're like, oh, I do have control over my own feelings and my own thoughts. So that's like one of my top books right now. That's cool. Podcast. podcast any podcasts that you guys do yeah i'm all about podcasts yeah bigger pockets <clears throat> really good one um so bigger pocket bigger pockets and then um gosh i listen to cnbc a lot not podcast but i listen to that every i try to do it every morning that just helps me understand what's going on in the market i can learn how things are going with what the fed is going to talk about that that day uh which correlates to obviously interest rates um but yeah do you have any other um mine's more team generated but there is some good content for individual agents it's elite real estate systems that's a really good one out of nebraska cool um i would say so piggybacking on your um how to win friends influence people the, the, the dale carnegie wrote that book and he's there's a second book that he wrote it's called how to stop worrying and start living that book was the game changer for my real estate business like i read that book every year um, it is by far the most impactful book that has transformed my ability to deal with stress 
deal with anxiety and being able to like not feel and get pulled into because I even find myself thinking that being a good fiduciary was like feeling all the emotions of my clients. So my clients were stressed and my clients' houses weren't selling, then I felt the stress. When my clients were really frustrated, like I was taking that on. Like I was and it like limited my ability to take on more clients. I'm like, dude, I can't take on all your all your emotions. Like it was like too much. So for me, like that book was a game changer. So uh, how to how to stop worrying and start living was uh was awesome. So um, you guys are awesome. Thank you. Uh, just appreciate you guys a ton for sharing. 